right, folks, it's good to be here this morning. Amen. Amen. Father, we ask for wisdom, Lord. It's your word. I believe it. You know that. Give me understanding in it and give me the gift of teaching. And Father, give the folks ears to hear, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now if you go back to the book of Revelation with me this morning, please, chapter number two. The Revelation. When you think about what you're reading here, uh, this was written 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, folks, uh, is a long time in uh, the history of mankind, development of man, and uh, so forth. Uh, this language that the New Testament is written in is Greek, and that's the common language of commerce. In other words, if you could speak Greek, you could travel throughout the world and communicate in that language. That's why it's called the language of commerce. And uh, Latin, of course, was the language of uh, the Roman Empire and the Pax Romano. And what that means is the peace of Rome. If you wanted to be influential, you'd learn Latin. And then, of course, Hebrew is the, is the language of the Old Testament. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin comprise, therefore, the three basic languages that covered the known world at that time. When Pontius Pilate nailed over the head of the Lord Jesus the Titleist, and that's what it's called, the Titleist, the apostles said that he made a show of them openly, he triumphed over them. Uh, Pontius Pilate wrote it in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, and that was to reach all the uh, known world. He was broadcasting the gospel. Uh, when you think about the fact that Pilate preached the gospel, it's quite a remarkable thing, don't you? Because he nailed the title, This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's the full title. And he put it on the cross. So therefore, he was manifesting the cross to all the known world, to the languages of the world. And he told them that this was Jesus of Nazareth, talking about where he came from. Nazareth said in contradistinction to the fact that he is the King of the Jews. That's pretty good. God will speak through whoever he pleases. Make him different. But here in the book of Revelation... Uh, the second and third chapter of Revelation deal with the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now, as I said to you before, these churches were literal churches that existed 2,000 years ago. Sad, sad to say today that uh, as far as we could find, only one church at Smyrna, which is uh, present-day Izmir, Turkey, is, uh, still has a church with uh, a Christian presence. And that was where Polycarp, was martyred 2,000 years ago. And Polycarp was an old man, and persecution arose in Smyrna, and they, they, uh, they uh, killed him, burned him at the stake for his faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, back then, emperor worship was quite a thing. If you travel anywhere in the east or Turkey or any places like that, you'll find... Uh, you'll find uh, statue or what have you, after statue of emperors. And they were very vain people. They wanted you to see their likeness. They wanted to leave their likeness in stone. They're like, uh, if you ever go to, to uh, 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 Egypt, you'll find, I was amazed with this, Ramses. I'm telling you, this bird from one end of Egypt to the other had, had, stone, had stones carved out in his likeness. One was over a hundred feet long, and we went into a building that uh, held this thing, and it was huge. All about Ramses. The problem is that Ramses had to leave and leave behind all of that vanity, and go out into the uh, go out into eternity. But anyway, the uh, second and third chapter of the book of uh, Revelation speaks to the churches of Asia Minor. Now, there's a number of ways of interpreting this, as I told you before. You can take the preterist point of view, which means that all of it's been fulfilled, and it was fulfilled in the first century after Christ, somewhere in there. Some certain churches today take that point of view. You can take the uh, 
uh, futurist point of view by saying that, well, all of it's future, that everything is future, you see. And, uh, or you could take the historical point of view, which means that you accept it as historical fact, but prophecy is included in it. In other words, there's a reason for these seven churches existing more than just the fact that they were there 2,000 years ago in that geographical location. That's the point of view that I take. I take the historical point of view, and that as I believe that these churches exist, but I believe that there's a message here and a prophecy here that looks into the future. The reason I do is because each one of these seven churches has a unique identity, and it can be traced down through the years, for the last 2,000 years, to ages of the church, periods in the church. For example, the first church here is Ephesus, and this is what we would call the apostolic church, starting at somewhere along about 33 A.D. and uh, uh, up until uh, somewhere about 150, 200 A.D. These are general figures. Nobody can pinpoint any certain date on anything except dates in history that refer to things like uh, councils, like the Council of Nicaea, 325 A.D., or the time that Constantine saw the cross, 313 A.D., things like that. So the first church is the apostolic church age, and it's the apostolic church age that was, was truer to the Bible than any of the rest of them except the church of Philadelphia. And the apostolic church age tried those that said they were apostles and found them liars. They separated themselves from the Judaizers who tried to say that you had to keep the law and be circumcised and all of this to be a Christian. Uh, so in plainer words, what they were trying to do is make Christianity just an extension of Judaism, like the Kabbalah and all the rest of that is. Uh, all of this went on in the first century after Christ. Satan made a real effort to try to uh, infiltrate the church with every kind of false doctrine that he possibly could within the first hundred years. And he did a good job of it in a lot of, in a lot of areas. But historically it refers to the apostolic church up until about 200 A.D. The next church in line here in chapter number 2, verses 8 through 11, is the church of Smyrna. That word Smyrna means myrrh, and this is the time of the persecution of the church. Great persecution, official persecution, ten imperial persecutions, if you please, under the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire had power. It was the powerful, it was Caesar, it was the, it was the, it was the secular power of the day. Uh, for example, right now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the word hegemony or not, or hegemony, I forget which way it's pronounced. I think it's hegemony. It means the it means the projection of power of a of a, of a of a country or an empire or a republic, what have you. And what do you mean by that? I mean by that that we have the geographical boundaries of the United States of America. We have what's called the continental U.S. It's the 48 states. Then you have Alaska. Then you have Hawaii which make up the 50 states of the United States. But the power of the United States of America reaches far beyond our borders. Right. Anybody agree with that? Amen. All right. Well, Rome did the same thing. The power of Rome was seated in, in uh, Rome, Italy, but its power was projected far beyond the borders of Rome. <clears throat> Therefore, it controlled the known world. Therefore, it became an empire, and that's why we call it the Roman Empire, like the Grecian Empire or the Persian Empire, Grecian under Alexander the Great, the Macedonian. We, no, we, no, we call these empires because an empire reaches out beyond its borders and pulls the rest of the world in. Say, so, well, is that important? Yes, because the Antichrist will have an empire. He will have a centralized location for his government, but his power will be projected to the ends of the earth. And uh, the way the United States does that is, is a number of ways. One of them is through its navy, because the United States has a powerful navy. And we have trident submarines that are underneath the surface of the, of the ocean that can wipe whole countries off the face of the map. Just one submarine. That's a projection of power. The world, that's not lost on the world. They know that in order to be a superpower, you must be able to project that power wherever you want to. We can, we can, uh, we can uh, call up an army and uh, we can mobilize an army of a million men. Right now, I think uh, they just added, uh, they're, they're calling for 700, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, the, the Marine Corps has 196,000 active troops right now. The army has... Uh, uh, 
400 and something thousand active troops, maybe a half a million. But this country could, we could, we could field an army of 10 million men if we had to. And, uh, you know, uh, that's power to mobilize that kind of power and send these men out. You're talking about control, see. So the Roman Empire controlled the world at the time of the birth and growth of the early church. Controlled it. If, if the Roman Empire wanted to put its foot down on the preaching of the gospel, that's what it did. And that's exactly what it did. It began to persecute the preaching of the word of God. The Roman Empire wanted to wipe from the face of the earth Christianity. And the way they did it was to do away with the preachers, first of all. And Polycarp was the bishop in Smyrna. He was a pastor, a local pastor, had been there for decades preaching the word of God. So they wanted to do away with this man. They wanted to do away with Christianity because they had had enough time by the time of Polycarp, by 200 A.D., to see that the faith of Jesus Christ was not going to embrace emperor worship and it was not going to embrace any other pagan religion and that it was not part of Judaism. They were smart enough to know that. So they wanted to get rid of it. It's the same thing in China today. The Communist Party wants to get rid of Christianity. Or they want to refashion it. That's exactly what they do, see. But if you refashion it, you gut it and take its power out of it, then it's nothing but a shell, an empty shell. Like Christianity is in America, an empty shell. A profession with no possession. Because the church of God has power in it, folks. It has spiritual power. And once the church ever realizes the kind of power that's present for us, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, it changes everything. Amen. It's no longer a matter of a bunch of screaming and yelling from a pulpit and an empty profession and a bunch, of, a bunch of emotionalism. It comes down to the business of laying hands on people and watching them be healed. It comes to the business of people walking through the door as a whore and walk out as a saint of God. Amen. Pimps turn into saints. It's the power of God to transform lives. That's what the church is about. It's not a social structure. It's not an economic structure. It's not, we're not put here for temporal power to, to rule uh, states and so forth. That's what it's about. And I get to preach and quit teaching, amen. That's the problem. You, see, you, get, in, you get in here and you've you, you got to watch one. But anyway, that's what it is. It's the projection of power, see. And when you come under that, you're, you're, that's, that's what Rome did. They tried to stamp out the power. Of the church of God. Because it was a, it was a, it was a competing authority with them. It's competing, see. Competing for the hearts of the people. Competing. And the weapons of the church were, were not uh, spears, swords, shields, armies. Uh, the weapon was something that they didn't, ha they didn't know how to deal with it. They couldn't. So the thing, only thing they could do is just wipe it from the face of the earth. And so these seven churches represent seven successive stages, I believe, in the church. The reason I do is because you can take the seven churches and lay them down next to a, to a chronology of the church for the last 2,000 years. And you can see that there's some definite parallels there. And, as you know, it's not arbitrary. It's not something you just ram in there. These are parallels that exist. They're real. And the kind of thing you have to deal with. Because Smyrna represents the time from 200 to about 325 A.D. The reason we give you that figure 325 A.D. is because that's when the persecution of the church ceased, uh, and it ceased under the reign of Constantine. Now, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about Constantine because the next church that shows up in chapter number 2, verses 12 through 17, is the church at Pergamum. And Pergamum is a, it's a seat of learning, like Alexandria, Egypt. It's a religious seat because the high Babylonian priesthood was moved there and it is a secular seat because it is the it, it has a it has a it has an official capacity as one of the main depots of the Roman army, and beneath Pergamum, because I've been there, you have to look up on a hill to see Pergamum, is Asclepius, and Asclepius is the very is the very heart and soul of the healing arts because two thousand years ago that's what uh, that's what it was called, it's a serpent. You know, it's amazing to me how a serpent is connected with healing. A marvelous thing. Why would a snake be connected with healing? But have you ever seen a doctor? Have you ever seen the shield? Of the, it's a serpent. Well, that's Asclepius, folks. That's where it comes from. You know that now. And that comes from Pergamum. That comes from where the Bible says in the book of 
uh, a book of uh, Revelation, Satan's seat is. Now, let's look a little deeper at Satan's seat. Uh, I went through about six or seven Bible dictionaries, a couple of encyclopedias and all of that. See what they had to say about Satan's seat. Most of them gloss it over. They don't want to talk about it. But here and there, you can get into some material that will cover Satan's seat. As I said to you a moment ago, Satan's seat is the, is the high Babylonian priesthood that was moved from Babylon into Pergamos because of the control and power and authority of the Roman uh, the, uh, the Roman government, the Roman Caesar. Pergamum, therefore, becomes the location of a high mystical Babylonian priesthood that's associated with the healing arts. Now, that's quite a connection. I've got a bunch of photographs of that. When I went there, I photographed all kinds of stones. They had this tunnel, and our guide said that it's a long tunnel, too. That tunnel would run probably uh, half the length of this building. And the people who were sick would enter in one end of the tunnel and they'd walk all the way through the tunnel and exit the other side. Now, this is Asclepius we're talking about, which is right below Pergamum, part of the complex, part of the whole unit. They'd walk in one end and exit the other end. And while they walked through this tunnel, the guide now says this, that on, uh, located throughout the tunnel were these people who were whispering into their ears as they went through the tunnel and as they came out the other end, apparently they'd received all the hidden knowledge and hidden revelation they needed to to be healed. Now, you say, well, now, does Satan have anything to do with healing? Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. In Revelation 13, it says that he has power to perform miracles. So, you know, if Satan can inflict, he can remove the affliction. Yeah, you've got to be careful with it. You've got to watch it. You, you certainly do. Uh, I've read some stories about uh, uh, Mexico, for example. One lady down there in Mexico who can literally put her hand into flesh and pull out tumors. This is what they say she can do. That she can diagnose all kinds of problems and that she's uh, gifted in that area. And that uh, you say, well, now that's just, you know, how can anybody believe such a thing as that? Well, I'll tell you right now. The Bible in Revelation talks about those who have not known the depths of Satan. Satan has power, folks. He has enormous power. And the power he has, of course, has been granted to him by the hand of the Lord God. And God works through Satan, believe it or not. And right. Satan thinks right. he's doing it independently of God, but God's really working through him. God's God, folks. Yeah. Don't ever forget that he's the eternal almighty. Amen. Amen. And everything else, including Satan, is a creature. Amen. But in any event, Pergamum is also associated with the time because it's this period about 300 and something A.D. when the church became married to the world. And this admixture of healing arts and of the satanic sciences and the high mystical Babylonian priesthood and all of this came together. It became a unit. It became these, these foreign elements were brought together and became one unit. And that's what you've got to watch out for. You've got to watch out for that because that's exactly what is going to happen with the Antichrist and with the rise of the Antichrist. Seemingly unconnected foreign elements are going to come together. And they're coming together in one person. And the Bible says the dragon gave him his seat and his authority in talking about the Antichrist. So what we have here is a type of what's going to happen in the future. The type is this. A Roman emperor by the name of Constantine at the Milvian Bridge, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, saw a flaming cross in the heavens. And that, and in Latin, in hoc vincis or something like that, and I'm, not, I'm no good with Latin. But anyway, it says, by this sign conquer. That's what the translation would mean. By this sign conquer. What sign? Sign of the cross. He took it, therefore, to mean that the cross of Jesus Christ that had been under persecution for a long time, was now to become the very instrument of victory for him and for, his, uh, uh, for the challenge to his seat as the Caesar of Rome. So here's what he did. He took the cross and put it on all the shields and became the standard of the Roman Empire. And there's some, there's some controversy about this, but most of them say the cross is like this. Now, this cross like this, all right, do you know what this cross is called? That's right. 
St. Andrew's cross. Tradition tells us, not, not the Bible, but tradition tells us that St. Andrew, or Andrew, one of the apostles, was crucified on a cross like this. Tradition, of course, says that Peter was crucified upside down. Tradition teaches a lot of things. <laughs> You're always better off sticking with the Bible and saying, okay, that may be so, that may not be so. But anyway, he, had, he, saw, this he saw a cross in the heavens and said, by this conquer. And he took the first two letters from the name of Christ in Greek, Christos. The first two letters for the name of Christ in Greek are key, which is this, and Rho, which is this, that's C-H, key is C-H, R, Iota is the next letter, I, Sigma is the next letter, Tau is the next letter, and, and uh, Sigma is the last letter, if it's plural, all right? So he took the key Rho, the first two letters of the name of Christ, and he put them on a shield with a cross like this, here's the key, here's the key, C-H right here. And the roll comes up like that. How many have ever seen that? You've seen it. You've seen it time and again. You, it just didn't register in your mind what I'm talking about. That's the official shield of uh, the Roman Catholic Church. See? Roman Catholic. All right? And the cross, therefore, became an instrument elevated at that time that for everybody to understand that the cross was now set free and became the official faith of the, uh, of the Roman Empire. And Constantine had his armies baptized and had thousands of men converted at one time to the faith of Christ. How many of them truly received the Lord Jesus? I don't know. I'm not God. I'm not the judge. That's not my place. I'm just a preacher. And I'm sure some of those men probably did get saved. And thank God for everyone that did. But mass conversions don't work. They don't work. They don't work. Conversions are individual by the person. But anyway, here's what's important about this. Then he began to get into theology. A Roman emperor who has just been converted to Christianity, if he had been, he waited till, he was ba till, he, till his deathbed, we understand, until he was baptized because he felt like baptism was absolutely essential for him to be saved. Whether Constantine was truly saved or not, you can argue that till you're blue in the face. Amen. You know, and I pray he was, but I know what happened. And here's what happened. In order to build this Christian church that was so important to him now, he gave authority to bishops that they never had before. He elevated the position of a bishop. And not only to do that, but according to their tradition, he made a donation. It's called the Donation of Constantine. In other words, it is a legal document where the, where the, remember I talked about the projection of power and the ownership of land, Constantine donated or gave to the bishop certain authority over what's called papal states. How many's ever heard of papal states? Most of you haven't. You won't read about it on, you won't see it on NBC, CBS, ABC, Look Life, the rest of them. It's just not uh, uh, advantageous, whatever the... You know, papal state represents a physical, secular uh, a gift by the first man, the first Roman emperor who called himself a Christian, to the Catholic Church. The papal states literally were uh, geographically located in Europe, Italy, and that area over in there that we know was under the Roman Catholic Church for centuries. The papal states, of course, were headed up by the pope. And the pope received his authority for heading up these papal states, which existed within a state, a state in a state. You need to understand that. The papal state was a, was a, was a spiritual uh, sovereignty, a spiritual authority over secular states. See? The papal states. And the pope had, the, had absolute authority. So what happens here now? What, what's going on? See, here's what Constantine did. He officially recognized Christianity as the state religion and no more, no more persecution. Elevated the position of the bishop and then he donated, the donation of Constantine, he gave to these bishops or the bishop of Rome, which, uh, who, who became the most important, the one eventually, uh, gave them the states, 
that uh, literally gave them authority under the, under the authority of the, of, of the Roman emperor to rule over these states, the papal states. And up until 18 and, and 60 to 65, when Italy declared its independence as an independent sovereign country until 18 in the, in the middle of the 1800s, folks, that's not been long ago. These papal states were in full power and full authority. When this country, 17, when this country in 1776, in 1776, if you had gone to Europe, you would have been right smack in the middle of a setup of an ecclesiastical church state setup that started 2,000 years ago. And most folks, you know, in America, born and raised here, you know, have no, don't have a clue about that. But that's the way it was. So when I look over here at Smyrna and the next, uh, or Pergamum rather, and the next one at Thyatira, because Thyatira leads us into the Dark Ages from 500 to 1000 A.D., I know that I'm not just forcing things in here and I'm not making things fit. This happened. It happened. And it's very important for me to emphasize this fact again. That the Bogomiles, the Donatists, the Albigenses, the Cathari, the Paulicians, and all the rest of the names that go along with these people, and there were many groups, the Cathari, I don't know if I mentioned them or not, were never part of the Roman Catholic Church. Say, so why is that important? I'm going to tell you why it's important. If you believe the myth that they were, then what you're saying is that the Catholic Church was the church, the only church, and that for a long time it was okay, and then it went bad. And when it went bad, then the Protestants, protesters, see, rebelled against the Catholic Church, came out of it. So essentially the only thing it needs is a reformation, but that's not true. Because what we have here, it started in Pergamum, and it started with its roots and its basis wrong. They started from the teachings of the fathers. They took the authority of the apostolic fathers, the, the anti-Nicene, post-Nicene fathers. They took the teachings of these men, and that became the basis for the doctrines that they're preaching and teaching today. Now, that doctrine that they're preaching and teaching today is going to envelop the whole church as you know it in America and the world because the church as you know it in America and the world is going to fit right in to this category of Revelation chapter number 17 when it talks about the whore. There are millions of true believers in Jesus Christ on this earth right now who love him and would die for him in his name. No question about that whatsoever. But if you cannot see that in this country the church is an empty shell, it is a professing nothing, that the only thing that motivates most people in this country is how much wealth, prosperity, what have you, that they can get. If you can't see that, you're, 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 you're you know, <laughs> Senator Charles Grassley, after a two-year investigation, named six, which was very... <laughs> Generous on his part. Amen. He named six of these uh, mega church, uh, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, uh, so forth. He named six of them to turn in their financial records. And one of them right now is, 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 uh, is hot about it and is not going to. And is claiming that the Internal Revenue Service is the only ones that he, he should turn his stuff into. But anyway, he has started something that may go f much, much further and deeper than he ever thought. Because you see, one time, you know the domino effect. One thing, totally unknown or unsuspected or not even considered to be part of it, you flip that first domino on, over, and about a mile down the road, a domino falls that you didn't even know was connected. In plain words, what he has started may very well uh, begin to reach out in other directions. And uh, it's all you can do is just uh, observe. But uh, it's uh, it's... To these six, and I'm sure many others who've preached the same thing, if they're smart, I hope they're smart enough to understand they're under the gun. And somebody's watching them very carefully. And the moment that this was announced to these six, you know how lawyers are. You know how the courts are. 
They'll watch every move they make from that moment on. If they try to hide assets, if they try to do this or that or this or that, they're going to watch everything they do. And what they do after they, that it was announced to them is incriminating. Because if they've got something to hide, then that's the problem. All right? And the church of Laodicea, let's jump forward a long way. The church of Laodicea is the church of the rights of the people. And that's the last church. And that's the church of about 1900 to the present. And the church of Laodicea, he said, you are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. Now, however you may figure the rest of these churches, can you not see that from, say, the church of uh, 250, 300 A.D. up till about 1,000 A.D., when you enter into the Dark Ages, and a lot of reasons why we went into the Dark Ages, you know, but uh, can you not see that when that church was persecuted, it was persecuted, it was purified, and it was purged? You will never stamp out the church. You'll purge it. A true believer will not be stamped out. It's not going to happen. They've tried it in China. They've tried it, they've tried it in a lot of places. They've tried it in Russia. It will not happen. But what you will do is purify the church. Persecution always purifies the church. And one of the things it says in the book of Revelation is that in the end time, that this whore in Revelation 17 that's riding on the back of this beast, it says that the beast will turn against the whore. And now that's Senator Charles Grassley. I'm not saying he's the beast. Right. <laughs> don't, don't make claims that I'm not saying. I'm not saying that for a minute. But I am saying that a secular power, a secular government, has now turned completely and has begun to look at this whore. And now, friend, I would not hesitate to tell you this morning. I would not hesitate to say this. And I'd say it to their face. When all you get up to front people and you preach, you become a millionaire and you, you give Bentleys as gifts. Right. You, you, you have $2 million uh, penthouses in New York. And you live in multi-million dollar houses. Right. And you live, you live, you, when you live like that off of the gospel... You belong to the whore. Right. Yep. Yeah. 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 And, you know, for what few you might have gotten saved, there are tens of thousands of people in this country that would not darken a church door for the very reason that they are so sick and tired of hearing these self-serving, greedy devils get up in the pulpit week after week and talk about sowing your seed and your prosperity. They're sick of it. And that's what's happening. And I'm sick of it. Amen. You're sick of it. Yep. I'm sick to death of it. And I'm so sick of it. I'm at the point now where I say, you are not my brother right. or my sister in the Lord. Right. The other day I was praying. And in my prayer, I had a spirit speak to me. And that spirit said to me, would you like to be rich? Mm. It did. Mm. Has the spirit ever spoken to you? Oh, yeah. You know what I said back to that spirit? I said, no. Just like that. I said, I'm not interested in being rich. I said, the Lord will take care of me. And he'll supply my needs according to his riches and glory. The one that I served didn't have a place to lay his head. The only garment he had, they cast lots for it. He said, the foxes have holes. Son of man hath not a place to put his head. He had to take his money to, buy, to pay his taxes out of the mouth of a fish. The Lord Jesus Christ was an itinerant traveling preacher that never had two pieces of money to rub together in his life. And when a pervert gets up in the pulpit and tells yeah, you yeah. that he was rich, yep. he was rich, but it wasn't money. Right. But he could have called money into being anytime he pleased. But it wasn't about money with him. A man is a pervert that will say that. And I challenge any pervert to show me one verse of Scripture in the New Testament that shows me where the Lord Jesus Christ was monetarily rich. No, he wasn't. No, he was not. No, sir. No, sir. Because he didn't live by riches. He said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Amen. And you know what that meat was when he told him that? He went down to Samaria to a woman at a well. Right. Amen. He said, my meat is to do the will of the Father that hath sent me. Right. That's what he said. Amen. I'm a Christian. Yes, sir. 
I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not interested in driving Bentleys. I'm not interested in being a multimillionaire. The Bible said, They that would be rich fall into divers' snares. The Apostle Paul said, Having food and raiment, therewith be content. These prosperity pimps, mark it down, put it, put it somewhere, will spend nine-tenths of their time in the Old Testament with scriptures that apply with a, with a, with a temporal blessing on this earth. And then I'm not saying that it wasn't right, but it had to do with God's covenant with Israel. And the temple, Abraham was a rich man. Job was a rich man. But the promises and all this stuff that they're pulling out, they're pulling it out of the Old Testament that had an application to them. They say, well, you're a, prov a poverty preacher. Is anybody here in poverty? I've never met a believer in Jesus Christ in my life in poverty. What do you mean? I've never met one that's living for the Lord that's tithing their income, that's doing what God's called them to do, that's in poverty. I've never have. Now, I've met some backslidden Christians out here in the world, turn their back on God, and they wind up out here in the pig pen, uh, you know, feeding hus to the swine. That can happen. Yes, sir, it can happen. Have you ever met a Christian? Now, I'm not saying that something couldn't happen all of a sudden, wipe out your bank account, but if you belong to the Lord, God will put it back. He'll take care of you. He will take care of you. He will. Yes, sir. So these people, I don't know, I don't know their God. Right. I don't know who they're talking about. When they're talking about Jesus, I don't have a clue who they're talking about. But the Jesus of the New Testament is the itinerant preacher that didn't have two dimes to run, rub together. But he said, I could call 12 legions of angels. So by that, I renounced the church of Laodicea. I renounced the church of Laodicea publicly and openly. Amen. And you say, why do you do that? Because spirits are listening to what I'm saying right now. I renounce this church of Laodicea. I am no part of it. And every opportunity I have, I will expose it for what it is. It's a bunch of lying, yep. deceiving, greedy devils that don't know anything about the one that saved me in 1973. Amen. 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 I identify the church of Philadelphia. Because the church of Philadelphia is the church of the 1800s. Right. And the church of the 1800 sent missionaries to the ends of the earth. Yes, they sir. sure did. Amen, and preached the word of God from one place to the other. Amen. Amen. And God blessed them. And he said, this is the church of the open door. I've set before you an open door. And it was open. And they went through it. Amen, and the greatest missionary activity, I guess you can imagine. Because a lot of the missionary activity today is following in the footsteps of the missionary activity of the 1800s right. right. that opened the door for them. Yeah. So they could go in. But that's not to take away from a lot of the missionary work that goes on today because we've got some fine missionaries. This church supports some fine missionaries on the mission field preaching the Word of God. All right. So that brings us down through the Church of Philadelphia and the Church of Laodicea. It brings us down to the present time, and it brings us down to... Uh, it kind of It kind of lays in perspective for us what uh, uh, where we are because church history, I believe, church history is the foundation that will open the door for you into the future to understand what's going to happen. I don't know if it's a Frenchman or a German or who it was, but he said, he said, men never learn the lessons of history because he said history repeats itself. It repeats itself, and it does. No fewer years that I've lived on this earth, I've watched it repeat itself. I've watched, I've watched, I've watched people make the same mistakes, I watched government make the same mistakes, and then I watched history repeat itself. Amen. All right. Now, the next chapter, the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 1, everything changes. It all changes. And I want to show you a remarkable thing about this book. In chapter number 1, verse 9 of Revelation, it said, I, John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Jesus is mentioned for the last time in the book of Revelation all the way over till you get to chapter 12. Look at chapter number 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with a woman, now, who's the dragon here? All right. Satan is like a chameleon. 
or even more, more so. He is a, he is a creature that has, a, he has the ability to manifest himself in a lot of different ways. He sure can. So it says in Revelation 117, And the dragon was wroth with a woman who went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right? We have gone all the way from chapter 1 to chapter 12, and the name Jesus is not mentioned one time. That's quite a thing. But the lamb is. You see, Jesus is mentioned, but not by the name. Now, when you go through the book of Revelation... Chapter 1, verse 9, last time. Chapter 12, verse 17. Look at chapter number 14, verse 12. Now let's see if you can see the connection here. Look at Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now we're talking about tribulation saints here. Look at chapter 17 and verse 6. Now mystery Babylon, I told you, was seated at Pergamos. Change this location. That's Satan's seat. But look at verse number 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. All right. Now go on to chapter number 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. He said to me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for this testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Chapter number 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify to you the things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Chapter number 22, verse 20. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Chapter 2, 22, verse 21, last time. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, you see what, see what, 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 what it, what's here? What did I miss? Who calls him Jesus? All through the book of Revelation. Believers. Believers. See, believers. Uh, here's my point. The world doesn't know who Jesus Christ is. Amen. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. See, they've heard the name Jesus. And the Bible said, "There's a, if any man come to you preaching another Jesus. But the Bible says there's going to come a time that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Well, you go through the whole book of Revelation. I mean, this is the last book of the Bible, see? Not a soul in there ever calls him Jesus except believers. You know what that tells me? That tells me one day, I don't know how God's going to do it and when he's going to do it, but he's going to let this world understand who Jesus Christ is when they see him for who he really is. And that name Jesus rings and reverberates throughout eternity. They'll all say Jesus. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, the church has been preaching Jesus. We've been singing about Jesus. We've been talking about Jesus. We love Jesus. That's what it's about, folks. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about our buildings and our money and our ministry and all that. A lot of these things are fine, but it's about Jesus. But it's not to the world. But it's going to come up from this earth, from all creation. Every mouth, including Satan, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The name of Jesus will rise up from every creature. Every creature of Adam's race, you'll hear him say it. You've been saying it a long time. You're going to hear them say it. Yeah, that day's coming. You're going to hear him say it. They're going to say Jesus, brother. Amen. Amen. I want to hear it, don't you? Yes, sir. He's the one that saved me. Yes, he called me into the ministry. Amen. He's the one who changed my life. Amen. He's the one that I run back to every time to get my mind back, yes, get my bearings back, right. find out where I'm coming or going. Yes, he's the one that gave me a foundation to stand on. Amen. He's the one that gave me a home in heaven. 
He's the one 2,000 years ago that stretched his arms out there on that cross and said, go ahead and nail it up. Nail those nails in because I love Charles Lawson. Who's he? I know who he is. I know the day he's going to be born. That Roman soldier didn't have a clue that when he nailed him to the cross, he was nailing my sacrifice on the tree for me. Amen. God used the wrath of man to praise him. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. You think you can get mad at God and stomp out of here today and blaspheme and cuss and do this and that and all you're doing and all you are, all you are is a vehicle in the hand of Satan to glorify God. <laughs> because he will be glorified. Amen. <laughs> you say, he won't get any glory out of my life. He'll glorify God. You'll glorify him in a way you never imagined possible. Say, so how can he do that? He's God. <laughs> My God's bigger than your God. <laughs> My God's bigger than your God. If your God's not the right God. And my Jesus is big. My Jesus can whip your Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I saw a bumper sticker the other day and it said, what was it? It said, my, my son can whip your, uh, your, your, somebody, you know, they talk about my, my, my child can read at such and such a level, which is fine. <laughs> But he said, my, uh, my son can whip your reader. Something of that nature. Yeah. 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 Well, that's sad, isn't it? Jesus is Lord. God Almighty. And the next time he comes back to the earth, he'll come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because when he comes for his church, he's not coming to the earth. He stops in the clouds. Amen. Amen. But when he comes and puts his feet down upon this earth, it is as a conquering king yes, and the Lord of all lords. Amen. And they will say Jesus yes. is Lord yes. to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. Brother Peach, dismiss us, please. Amen.